Okay, so I'm going to make a mind map on simple harmonic motion and circular motion as fast as possible. You can download the PDF version of this from the link down below. So the first thing we know is that if something moves in a circle, then the force, that's the centripetal force, must be pointing towards the center of the circle, the center of the path. And velocity is at a tangent to the path at any point. The equation for centripetal force is F equals mv squared over r. Force and velocity are always perpendicular to one another. And actually that's the only condition needed for circular motion to happen. Because the force is at right angles to the velocity, that means that we have a constant speed, but it's always accelerating towards the center without actually getting closer. And if F equals mv squared over r, then that means acceleration is just v squared over r. So omega looks like a w, but it's not, is angular speed or angular velocity or angular frequency, three names for the same thing. It's how fast something spins, but it's not revolutions per second because that would just be normal frequency. It's radians per second. So let's have a think about this. Velocity is going to be circumference, two pi r divided by time period. That's the same as two pi fr. And we know that frequency times two pi is going to be radians per second. So actually V is equal to omega r. Very important equation to remember. And I've forgotten to write in how we substitute that into our centripetal force equation, but I have added it into the PDF. If V equals omega r, substituting that into our centripetal force equation, we end up with F equals m omega squared r. Okay, so what if we have something going in a circle vertically, like a loop the loop for a roller coaster? Quite often we'll be asked to find the support force at different points. At the bottom, just think, what would the support force have to be just to hold a stationary roller coaster car there? Well, it would be just mg. But the support force is not only supplying a force to balance the weight, but it's also supplying the centripetal force. So it's mv squared over r plus mg. On the side, weight doesn't factor in because they're at right angles, so the support force is just mv squared over r. At the top, we know that the support force is going to be less than what it is at the bottom, so it's mv squared over r minus mg. Weight is helping, as it were. This is the same for a pendulum when it's at the very bottom of its swing not any other point though but at the bottom it is circular motion so we can say that the tension in the string is mv squared over r plus mg okay so let's look at a banked track then this one confuses people just remember that it is not the same deal as just a car or something on a slope or on a ramp it's slightly different okay so let's have a think about this the bank track is at an angle theta and we know that there is a support force that has to be perpendicular to the surface now with just a ramp we know that this is equal to mg cos theta that means that it's going to be smaller than the weight however in this case the car is also going going round in a circle. So that support force not only has to balance mg, it also has to supply the centripetal force horizontal to the weight. Now I've drawn that too big, I'll fix that in a second. So that means that that support force is going to be mg divided by cos theta, because the support force is the resultant force in this case. So we know that the centripetal force is going to be mv squared over r, yes, but just using the weight, if we take mg cos theta, then times by sine theta, then that means that the centripetal force is also equal to mg tan theta. Going to prove that to yourself, then make a triangle on the left with mg on the left, and it should all become clear. And that's going to be the same for a plane that's banking as well or rolling. The biggest force here is the upthrust supplied by the wings. And similarly, the centripetal force is going to be equal to mg tan theta again. Okay, so let's go on to SHM then. So the only two conditions needed for SHM to occur, the force acting on an object has to be proportional to its displacement from equilibrium where it was, and also it has to be in the opposite direction. We need both of those things to be true. The equation that satisfies these conditions is A acceleration equals minus that shows that it's in the opposite direction to displacement, omega squared x. Amplitude is the maximum displacement from equilibrium. We don't really talk about maximum amplitude, maybe when it comes to damping resonance, but not when it comes to normal SHM. So try not to use the words maximum amplitude when in fact you just mean amplitude. So looking at our conditions at the top, then that means that the maximum acceleration is going to be at x equals a, so a max is equal to omega squared a. Yeah, we've missed out 
out the minus because we're just concerned with what the maximum acceleration of a system is. It doesn't matter in which direction because it's going to be in both, isn't it? Okay, this is an equation that tends to confuse people. It's the very first equation, as it were, for SHM. It tells you what the displacement of the object is going to be at any time t. x equals a amplitude times sine or cos, just depends when you start timing, 2 pi ft. Don't forget that you need to be in radian mode on your calculator to use this equation. Anything that isn't degrees is pretty much always going to be radians. Sine 2 pi ft is going to give you a number between 0 and 1. So all this equation does is tell you what the displacement is going to be compared to the amplitude. And it's always going to be less. Okay, velocity at any point. V equals omega times square root of a squared minus x squared. Yes, plus and minus because it's going to be in both directions, isn't it? This equation very rarely gets used. What does get used is the equation when we're talking about maximum velocity, maximum speed. That's when x is equal to zero. So that means that we just end up with 2 pi f a or omega a. And of course, we get maximum velocity at equilibrium. Okay, so let's draw a graph of what's happening to the displacement over time. This is the graph version of the equation, x equals a sine 2 pi ft. And we can see that we have the maximum displacement at plus a and minus a, the amplitude. We've got the time period, 1p to the next. There's not much that you can do with this, but you can get v max from it. All you have to do is do the calculation 2 pi fa and get the frequency from 1 over the time period. You can find the gradient at equilibrium. That's the maximum gradient, isn't it? But it's not going to be very accurate. It's much better to use the equation. And I'm drawing a dotted line here to show what acceleration is doing. We know that it's going to be in the opposite direction, so it's just a flipped version of displacement. Velocity, on the other hand, you need to be a bit careful. You need to think, okay, when it's going through equilibrium from positive to negative displacement, that's when we have maximum velocity, but in the negative direction. So I'll put a little cross there. And then put a few crosses in, and then you can start joining them up. So velocity is 90 degrees out of phase with both displacement and acceleration. Okay, let's talk about damping. It's when we have an external force that is opposing the motion. It's always in the opposite direction to the velocity. It's always trying to slow it down. And we have three types. So I'm going to draw them on this graph here. Here's my light damping line. This is the main form of damping. The amplitude decreases over time. So that means that energy decreases as well. That's something like air resistance for a pendulum. Here we have heavy damping, also known as over damping. You're damping it so much that you're really stopping it from oscillating at all. The displacement of the object just comes down slowly. And then we have critical damping on the left there. You can't see it very well. But that's when we let something go through a quarter of an oscillation to get down to equilibrium as quickly as possible and then jam on the brakes, as it were. We apply that critical damping force to stop it oscillating any further. OK, if we're talking about damping, we might as well talk about energy real quick. If we're to find the total energy of a system that's also the same as asking for the maximum kinetic energy okay or the maximum potential energy as well but usually we're going to calculate it with half m v max squared if you're given the height of a pendulum then chances are you're going to have to calculate what the maximum speed is as it goes through equilibrium using conservation of energy gpe equals ke so you don't even need the mass for that okay we're talking about energy getting less with damping but what about resonance that's when we have an external driving force like me pushing someone on a swing whereas the component of their weight was the only force that's the restoring force involved before and resonance is when the frequency of an external driving force like me pushing matches the natural or resonant frequency frequency of the system. So it's like me pushing with the same frequency as the frequency as the person is swinging on the swing. And we say that we must have some light damping involved as well. You don't need to know why. Okay, so you might see a graph then that has amplitude on the y-axis and then f over f0, the ratio of the driving force frequency to the resonant or natural frequency. And what you should see is it getting a lot bigger when this gets to one. In other words, when they are the same. If you do damp a system that is resonating, it makes the peak lower. Another thing you need to know is that the driving force is 90 degrees or half pi radians out of phase with the restoring force. With the example of me in the swing, I would push when they're 
at the bottom when they're at equilibrium. The restoring force is zero at that point, but I am pushing at that point. Okay, going back to energy, this is how the various energies are changing over the course of an oscillation, because we know that total energy shouldn't change so long as there's no damping or resonance. And we have maximum kinetic energy at equilibrium and maximum potential energy at amplitude. We have two equations that tell us what the time periods are for a spring and a pendulum. For a spring, T equals two pi root M over K. And for a pendulum, it's two pi root L over G. Bear in mind that you might get asked how does the frequency and time period change when you put two springs in parallel or in series. K doubles when we have springs in parallel and halves when we have springs in series. So I hope that's helpful. If it is then please leave a like and if you think I've missed anything then put it in a comment down below and I'll see if I can add it to the PDF for you. If you want to test your knowledge on this then click on the card and it'll take you to my flashcard questions. See you there.